Before we start, I wanted to mention, as I did in the Stranger Things video, that I would never willfully want to put down another creator's work of art. It's important to know how much heart and soul is poured into the monstrous shows that Ryan Murphy makes, but that doesn't mean they don't have flaws. If you're an avid fan of television, or even just a tepid viewer of it, chances are you've heard the name Ryan Murphy. With his name attached to some of the biggest TV shows on television like Glee, American Horror Story, and American Crime Story, he has accumulated a small empire of award-winning television that just keeps growing. As this empire grew larger, its infrastructure grew weaker, being built on the backs of shows that quickly dilapidated in quality. But every empire has a beginning. Where did it all start? In 1999, a show premiered on WB called Popular. Hardly Ryan Murphy's best, most creative, or most famous show, Popular was your typical teen dramedy that laid a lot, and I mean a lot, of the groundwork for Glee. A short blurb in the novel that is Ryan Murphy's resume, Popular ended on a massive cliffhanger and just kind of disappeared from the world. A few years later, a serial medical drama called Nip Tuck premiered. This is where things really started to pick up steam. The first two seasons, having won critical acclaim and multiple TV awards, had garnered the attention of those who hadn't watched Popular. It felt different, new, and exciting. However, something changed with season 3. Many agree that Nip Tuck season 3 began to slide in quality and did not live up to what the first two seasons had laid as predecessors. From there, Nip Tuck had an extremely rocky run, from a split season with the writer's strike to a finale that Ryan Murphy wasn't even present for. The audience reception was more mixed too. So let's roll back a little. Let's say that season 3 was a fluke. It had a storyline that many seemed to enjoy, it just didn't stick the landing too well. But what happened with the rest of the seasons? Well, he was working on something else. Now the most I can do is assume, because I doubt Ryan Murphy would ever come forward and say this, but darn it if these assumptions aren't well informed. Let's put together the facts. In late 2006, Ryan Murphy released a movie called Running With Scissors, around the same time as Nip Tuck Season 4. From that we can assume that between the average time it takes to make a feature film, plus adding some time for him writing the screenplay, and we'll be generous and say it was like two weeks instead of what it seems to take other writers, he basically made this film over the entire production period of Nip Tuck Season 4. But wait, that's not it. In 2005, a man named Ian Brennan had an idea for a film based off of his experiences in high school show choir. He couldn't generate interest for a few years though. Through the power of having a friend who knows a friend, Ian Brennan came into contact with Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk, creators of Nip Tuck, and the rest is history. Brad Falchuk said, hmm, let's make it a TV show, which was a bad idea, and I'll explain why in a little bit. The show got picked up by Fox, and they wrote all the episodes together, probably instead of writing Nip Tuck. Now I have a lot of problems with Glee. A lot of problems, none of them being the problems most other people seem to have like the bad covers or Ryan Murphy's wet dramatization of high school in favor of the arts. I mean, I wish my high school loved the arts, but not like this. No, a lot of the problems come with the fact that this show never stopped having problems with what it wanted to be. Let me explain. Remember when I said that it was a bad idea to make Glee a TV show? I want to shed some light on that. If you look at season 1 of Glee, you'll see that there are 22 episodes, 13 of which premiered sequentially in 2009 and the other 9 in 2010. It's not unusual for a show to have a mid-season finale, but this affected Glee in a major way. Its original season was meant to be 13 episodes, and when it got so popular, Fox extended it to an extra 9 episodes after the first 3 aired. That's why the first 13 episodes wrap up so well. Finn finds out he's not the dad but sticks around anyway, Glee wins sectionals, Emma's wedding is cancelled, Will chooses Emma, the Glee club is finally happy, it's the perfect finale to wrap up the arcs from that season. In the second half of the season, although still good, you see the effects of them having to extend a story they weren't prepared for. Rachel gets literally all the screen time. The funk episode is the definition of filler. Comparing Rachel's tonsillitis to Sean's paralysis is borderline offensive. The song count almost doubled per episode and the star power became unbearable with Glee constantly poking in your face. You remember her? She was on Broadway, and so was he, and so was he! You have two purely tribute episodes, both written by Ryan Murphy, but ironically they're the best episodes of this half of the season. Did I mention that Rachel got all the storylines? Jesse St. James, Shelby Corcoran, Tonsillitis, her and Finn love drama, her bad reputation video, losing her virginity, etc. The finale was amazing though. Except, why did Shelby adopt- you see how the decision by Fox to extend this show affected its long-term quality. Probably because season 1 wasn't meant to go for as long as it did. Also probably because Glee was meant to be a movie, but that's besides the point. 
So Glee season one finishes. It's a surprise hit. The world goes crazy. It's been renewed for a second season, yada, yada, yada. What happens next? Well, exactly what was supposed to happen next. Glee was a prime example of a show for getting its initial concept. The reason I enjoyed Glee was because it wasn't inherently about singing and dancing. It was about a group of extremely different people coming to terms with their everyday problems through the environment of the Glee Club. Will Schuster's crumbling marriage, Rachel's alienation from her peers due to her need for success, Kurt's sexuality, Finn and Quinn's loss of reputation along with the responsibilities of being a parent, Sue Sylvester's need for power and dominance, etc. The different students also expressed themselves through different song styles, which expressed their personality. Rachel in Broadway, Finn in rock, Mercedes in soul diva music. It's not about being in Glee, it just revolves around how being in Glee affects everything else, and I know it sounds like I'm dancing around two things that are actually the same, but trust me when I say that they're not. The problem is eventually the storylines became, introduce this new Glee club, introduce that new Glee club. Will character A transfer to this Glee club because of a problem they had with character B? Oh no, they did. Rachel's banned from performing? She's the only one that sings the solos. How will they win regionals? What the hell are regionals? They never stop talking. And don't forget the all-time worst moment when Kurt didn't want to report Sebastian Smythe for throwing rock salt at Blaine because he wants to beat him at singing instead. Except what Sebastian did was a criminal offense and we all know season one Kurt would have been up in his face about this whole thing. A big factor in the show being pushed towards Glee-centric storylines is probably the millions of albums they sold, the concert tour, and the movie. I guess people forgot the music wasn't the only part of the show. The storylines themselves barely lasted for more than a few episodes. The themes of the show often bounced back and forth just to satisfy these clumsy storylines, like changing Coach Beast from a tomboy to a transgender man, Sam's dyslexia disappearing, Sue's continuous love-hate of the Glee Club. Honestly, I could talk about Glee for ages. There's so many different things that went wrong with it, that sometimes I just lie at night thinking to myself angrily about what a missed opportunity it was, and what a spectacular run the first 13 episodes had, kind of. But it doesn't stop there. At the same time Glee was being developed, Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk had an idea for a horror genre TV show. They were picked up by FX and began production for the show while the second season of Glee was airing. The show eventually became American Horror Story. American Horror Story is a horror anthology series where each season was set in a different time period and location, with members of the cast playing different characters each time. The first two seasons are widely considered to be excellent pieces of television, if not masterpieces. However, the quality quickly dropped off. Ryan Murphy, being the visionary director that he is, began favoring style more than the substance of the show. He went for shock and gore instead of the usual tense moments and mysteries that contributed to the show's early success. After Freak Show and Hotel became the most hated seasons of the series, both for different reasons, Ryan Murphy decided it was time to shake things up. The sixth series was a departure from the usual style American Horror Story films in, with a huge twist in the middle of the season like nobody had ever seen before. The problem? Ryan Murphy kept telling everybody about the twist, that there was going to be one, even what episode it was in. Really? Everyone knew what the twist was by the time the episode aired. Long story short, American Horror Story is having a rough ride too. However, it became very easy to capitalize on the success of an anthology series. It was renewed for multiple seasons at a time, acting on its popularity rather than the quality of the show. This was the beginning of the end. In the next few years, Ryan Murphy created The New Normal, a comedy that quickly faded away, and Scream Queens, a comedy horror that was maybe the hottest mess I've ever seen. The New Normal began development in 2012, around the time Glee was halfway through its third season. It was extremely different from all his shows, being a sitcom about a gay couple, something Murphy obviously identifies with, and their plan to have a child with a surrogate mother. It was okay. He totally ripped the birthing scene from Glee, though. Like, 100% just ripped that sucker and stuck it in the New Normal. Anyway, by 2013, the show was finite and Ryan Murphy needed something else to do, so instead of managing the two wildly successful shows that he had, he decided to just make another one that combined those two shows into one, and so became Scream Queens, a horror comedy anthology that was picked up for two seasons in its initial contract phase. And before I go off on Scream Queens, I just want to reiterate that sketchy point about Ryan Murphy's shows. They're mostly anthologized, which has made for easier renewal with the promise that the next season will be different. I mean, one is fine, and another is cool, but Ryan Murphy currently is on the masthead of four different anthology TV shows. Like, come on, really? I'll cut him some slack, though. Writing one good season and then giving up is his talent. So Scream Queens, a star-studded campy horror spectacular, one of two that came out that year. Scream Queens wasn't bad by any means. I mean, its first season wasn't. 
There was genuine mystery and intrigue, and it was also really funny. It was no masterpiece, but it did good. What Scream Queens really did, though, was expose Ryan Murphy as someone who oversells their product. Ryan Murphy failed to follow through on a lot of promises for Scream Queen Season 2, like how he said only four characters would survive into the next season, but that wasn't true, and how he promised three Halloween episodes in a tweet that has now been deleted. There was a lot of stylistic and creative promises that just didn't end up in the final product. Hmm, sounds familiar. Anyway, Scream Queen Season 2 bombs and it's cancelled due to feeling the story was complete. We all know what the real answer is, though. In 2014, around the same time Scream Queens was being developed, two men, Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, came up with the idea for American Crime Story, The People vs. OJ. And a little side tangent here, Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski are the main creators of this show, not Ryan Murphy, in the same way that Ian Brenner is the original creator of Glee, not Ryan Murphy. This bothers me because for some reason, whether name recognition or something else, Ryan Murphy gets a lot of the attention and praise that should be going towards other people. The People vs. OJ probably wasn't even supposed to be an anthology series. You can assume this from the fact that FX ordered Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk to produce and cast the show, and Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski didn't come back for the second season, which has already been significantly criticized. The People vs. OJ was a masterpiece, but it wasn't Murphy's masterpiece. He directed many episodes, but he didn't write a single one. Along those same lines, the writing staff of American Crime Story Versace consists of literally one person, and then this lady who helped for one episode. So I don't know if you've been counting, but up until now, Ryan Murphy has had four overlapping projects all at the same time. Wait, what? What did you say? Oh right, I missed one. He also directed The Normal Heart, a movie that was in production since 2011, filmed in 2013, and came out in 2014. Ironically, its main criticism was Murphy's directing. So that's five. Five huge greedy pies that Ryan Murphy was eating at once. And I only say was because he finished some of those pies, but in exchange for those pies, he baked Feud, 911, The Half Foundation, Pose, and his deal with Netflix for all future shows including Ratchet and The Politicians. That's eight different ongoing projects at the same time. While it is important to work hard and make a name for yourself in the industry, Murphy has done it at the expense of every single one of his projects, spreading himself thin instead of devoting all that talent to one or two. It's truly a shame because each of his works are so intensely powerful and creative, but he never gives any show the attention it deserves. One day, maybe Ryan Murphy will overcome his flaws. His need for constant creation, his loss of attention when he moves on to a different show, his overlapping production periods, his obsession with mass shootings, his altering of story details to fit his narratives, his tendency to make everything a musical, his style rather than substance approach to filming, his overpromises, and so on. I haven't even touched on his stereotyping of characters, including his inability to write a well-rounded female character, LGBT character, or person of color, without resorting to annoying film and television tropes like the sassy one, the one that screams a lot, which could probably just be renamed the Sarah Paulson, the mean blonde one, the dumb blonde one, the disabled one, the powerful one, the hot gay one, the punching bag, and a ton of others. Ryan Murphy is talented. Honestly, he is. But his talent is limited by his lack of an ability to set limits and focus on one project at a time. As I mentioned before, I would never willfully want to put down a creator's work, especially one as well-known and prolific as Ryan Murphy. However, I feel constructive criticism is appropriate, given that there's a lot that needs to be constructed, and a lot that's worth criticizing. Hopefully, Ryan Murphy finds the correct combination of style and substance on Netflix, a platform that has sprouted in creativity over the years. If he does, we might end up seeing his best work yet, 